Life and Times. Wayne Gretzky. Wayne would slide around on this little floor like he had skates on. A boy wonder. Oh yeah, there's a, a lot of pressure on me right now. Becomes the great one. Wayne has never been clocked as a, the fastest skater in the world, but try to stay with him. Hi and welcome. I'm Anne-Marie MacDonald. Wayne Gretzky didn't just play the game of hockey, he defined it. His journey from backyard rink to hockey icon is the stuff of legend. The great ones seem to lead a charmed life of championships, glory and good fortune. But Gretzky has also been battered by trouble and loss, an Olympic team failure, a gambling scandal that involved his assistant coach and the deaths of both his mother and grandmother. But as you'll see, the skinny kid from Brantford who became an unlikely superstar has always epitomized grace under pressure on and off the ice. On April 18, 1999, Wayne Gretzky stood alone in the spotlight. After a 21-year professional career, the player known as the Great One was leaving the ice for the final time. Gretzky has spent a lifetime in the spotlight, as a child, he attracted national attention. As a teenager, he was already a star. He was a small-town kid who became a Canadian icon. At times, he was larger than life. At others, he was only human. But on the ice, Gretzky stood alone. As a player, Wayne Gretzky turned the NHL record books into his own personal journal. In the executive suite, he became a national hero. But this story begins long before scoring titles and Stanley Cups. This story begins in a small town near Brantford, Ontario, where Walter Gretzky was a typical Canadian boy with a typically Canadian love of hockey. Well, I lived out in a country next to a little river, the Nith River, a little farmhouse, and uh, and the river itself wasn't uh, far, maybe 40 yards from the house. And in the winter time, we would just play, and and not for half hour or an hour at a time, all day long. That's all we did. Walter's hockey talents took him as far as Junior B. He joined the Bell Telephone Company as a lineman and settled down to married life. On January 26, 1961. Walter and Phyllis Gretzky welcomed their first son, Wayne Douglas Gretzky. The young family spent Saturday nights watching Hockey Night in Canada at Grandma Gretzky's farm. Grandma Gretzky had a pine wood floor, and Wayne would slide around on this little floor like he had skates on with a little miniature hockey stick, and she would sit there with a little stick and uh, be his goalie. In between periods, the big thing that I loved to do was grab a ball or, or um, roll up a sock and take a little hockey stick, and she'd play goal, and I would take shots on her. Uh, and then when the period would start, we'd watch the game again. The odd time he would miss, of course, and hit her in the shins. <laughs> we knew when that happened. <laughs> when Wayne was just two years old, Walter returned to the river by the farm with his young son at his side. He'd never ever been on skates before. I bought him a pair of skates, took him down to the river, put him on, put him on the ice, and he literally skated, just skated. Walter built a rink behind their house in Brantford. It became known throughout the neighborhood as the Wally Coliseum. Soon Wayne was spending more time on the ice than in the house. I would get on the ice before school and skate for an hour, hour and a half. Uh, when school was over at 3 o'clock, I would come home and I would skate till 5.30, quarter to 6, and then my parents would call me in for dinner. I would go back on the ice for another hour. And then Saturdays were basically spent from 8 in the morning till about 6 o'clock, 6.30 at night skating. There were some evenings, for example, it would be pretty late, it would be 10 o'clock at night, and I had a floodlight in the backyard, and his mother would say, Walter... Will you please go bring him in the house? It's 10 o'clock. The neighbors are going to think we're all crazy in this house. With a little imagination, the Wally Coliseum became an NHL arena 
and Wayne was number nine, the great Gordie Howe. To Howe, he's just the score! Gordie Howe! That's you know, you get the puck and you go around a pylon. It was always, you know, Gordie Howe goes around the defenseman, scores a winning goal in the Stanley Cup. We all did that. That's what it was all about. What Wayne wanted most of all was to leave the fantasy world of the backyard rink and join a real team. Although much too young to play organized hockey in Brantford, he convinced his dad to take him to a tryout. The first year he ever played, he was six years old. The youngest traveling team we had at that time were 10-year-old boys. He made that team. He scored one goal that year. Four years later for that same team, he scored 378 goals. And these were 10 minutes straight time periods. While Wayne was something special on the ice, away from the game, he was just another kid playing with his younger sister, Kim, and spending time at Grandma Gretzky's farm. We would go to visit my grandparents. Every Sunday was kind of um, a thing that the family did. You know, get there after church. We'd get there around 12.30, quarter to one. And my grandmother would make this whole homemade uh, dinner of, you know, Polish delicacies, sort of. And that was always a lot of fun. For Wayne, summer meant long days on the farm or playing lacrosse or baseball. The Gretzky family grew to include three more boys, Keith, Glenn, and Brent. But it was Wayne who attracted all the attention. As the trophy collection grew ever larger, Walter Gretzky made sure that his young son understood that with success comes responsibility. The biggest thing that he saw is that I had a love for this game. And for whatever reason, he felt that for some reason, uh, I was in a very special situation. I can remember after a game, we got beat 6-1, to one, and I was kind of, you know, nonchalant about it. And so I remember my dad very, you know, quietly saying, you know, it doesn't matter if it's the first game or the last game. You know, people are coming watch you play, and you got to play well every game. You can't have any bad games. I mean, he told me that when I was 9, 10 years old. Um, and he didn't say it to put pressure on me. He didn't say it to, to push me or motivate me. He just really believed that. Like his hero, Gordie Howe, Wayne wore number nine. At a Kiwanis Club dinner in Brantford, he got the chance to meet his idol. When I met Gordie Howe, I was 10 years old. He was bigger and better and nicer than I ever imagined. And all I did from that moment on was think about one day I'd love to play with Gordie Howe or against Gordie Howe. While barely a teenager, Wayne began to attract national attention. Newspaper and magazine articles were written, and radio introduced the young phenomenon to hockey fans from coast to coast. Wayne, how do you feel about all the publicity you, you, you've had? I mean, does it does it bother you? Do kids at school razz you about it? No, they they all just joke about it at school. They every day when I come back, they tell me all about it, and as if I didn't know about it. As Wayne attracted attention, he also attracted critics. Jealous parents called him a puck hog, even though he recorded as many assists as goals. I think the biggest problem that Wayne encountered was the fact that you take, if you have a boy in a team, and Wayne's on that team, who's got the puck all the time? Pretty soon, you, as a parent, are going to resent him. It never bothered Wayne at first, but it bothered me badly. What's sad about it is, out of the 30 parents, 26 or 27 of them were tremendous. And it's always the one or two or three bad apples in a, in a bushel cart that ruin it for everyone. And that pressure wasn't something that a normal 11, 12, 13-year-old needed to go through. I tried to tell Wayne that it would always be like that, that the better you get, the worse it's going to get, because everybody cares about their own. And so you're, you're going to be turned on and this did happen, so one of the reasons we moved him to Toronto. But 14-year-olds can't leave home for hockey. The Ontario Minor Hockey Association ruled that if Wayne wanted to continue in minor hockey, he had to return to Brantford. The courts agreed. Instead, Gretzky made the jump to Junior B. At 14 years old and 135 pounds, Wayne was now facing players as old as 20. After two seasons in Toronto, 16-year-old Wayne joined the Junior A Sault Ste. Marie Greyhounds. The move meant living with a new family and attending a new school. 
The Greyhounds already had a player wearing number nine. Wayne tried 14 before deciding on two nines. A Gretzky trademark was born. I like it up here so far. Uh, the hockey end of it, uh, I was the first draft choice. And right now, uh, all the fans are sitting right on my side, and uh, I'm happy for that. And uh, I just hope I keep going good. Gretzky became the top junior player in the country. At 17, he remained three years away from NHL eligibility. But in the 70s, there was a big league alternative. The World Hockey Association had grabbed headlines by signing some of the biggest names in the game. Now, they wanted the hottest prospect of them all. Nelson Scalvania was looking for someone for his Indianapolis racers. He wasn't drawing crowds. He wanted an attraction. Uh, he asked people around the league, the WHA, and they said the Gretzky kid. He was sort of a, a sought-after commodity from a public relations standpoint. That He was never going to be a great player, but we knew the NHL wanted this guy, and it would have been a coup to get him. Vancouver businessman Nelson Scalvania sent his private plane to bring the Gretzky family and agent Gus Bedali to Vancouver where Wayne was offered his first pro contract. He offered me a contract, and I said, great, I'll take it. <laughs> I was 17 years old, and my dad said, yeah, he's going to sign. And Gus kind of stepped in and said, he's not getting that. Hold on, we got to negotiate. Now, the contract was signed on the plane as they were flying back, and it was handwritten on a piece of foolscap by Wayne because Nelson was dictating it, and Walter said, here, you do this. I'm, my hand's shaken so much I can't hold the pencil. I wasn't making $40,000 a year working where I was, and all of a sudden you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's, it's mind-boggling. In 1978... 17-year-old Wayne Gretzky turned pro with the Indianapolis Racers. While Wayne attracted the attention of the hockey world, he couldn't draw a crowd in Indianapolis. After only eight games, Gretzky was traded to Edmonton. I knew the team was really in financial problems, and, and uh, I was just prepared for it. And if it happened, I, I kind of had an idea, and, and if it didn't, I wasn't going to worry about it. When, when that acquisition was made, there were a lot of people that still doubted very much whether the skinny kid who had bad skin and long hair could possibly have an impact on the league. 17 years old, he weighed about 155 pounds at that time, had the long, scraggly hair. And I can remember thinking to myself, this guy is going to be the next Gordie Howe. He knew there was an enormous amount of pressure on him to play in Edmonton. It wasn't like being in, in the U.S. now, and nobody knew him. Everybody knew Wayne. But he was already something special. Oh, yeah, there's a, a lot of pressure on me right now, and I uh, just don't have to go out there and not think about it, and that's what I'm trying to do, and just go out there and play my game. Life was changing quickly for Gretzky. In the WHA All-Star game, he lined up alongside his boyhood hero, Gordie Howe. And his 18th birthday present was the longest contract in professional sport. 21 years at almost a quarter of a million dollars a season. While Gretzky had long-term stability, the opposite was true of the WHA. In 1979, Wayne Gretzky faced his greatest challenge. The WHA had collapsed. The NHL expanded to include four teams from their former rival, including the Edmonton Oilers. The NHL was the top league in the world, the players bigger, faster, stronger. While many thought Gretzky would finally falter, his NHL debut was nothing short of spectacular. He tied Marcel Dion in the points race and was awarded the Hart Trophy as the most valuable player in the league. At season's end, a return to Brantford allowed Wayne to spend some time with his family. But summer was anything but a holiday, as endorsements and charity appearances kept him on the move. Wayne had grown up idolizing Gordie Howe. Now even Gordie was a Gretzky fan. He's a super young man who, it's a kind of reflection on his parents who brought him up. He got a certain charisma that uh, everybody falls in love with the kid. Oh my God! Howe, Gretzky, take two. Hello, I brought along a friend to help me tell you about the United Way. Find out what is needed in your town and then volunteer. I missed it again. <laughs> <laughs> Get him out of here! 
In only his second NHL season, Wayne began to rewrite the record books. He broke Phil Esposito's single-season points record and Bobby Orr's mark for assists. It all seemed too good to be true. And for some members of the media, the young superstar had yet to earn their respect. I don't know what I have to do uh, to make people believe. Last year, you know, it was my first year, and you can say, well, maybe you did have uh, just a lucky year. And, you know, why say anything about it? So I went on there and tried to put myself again this year, and I did it again this year, and then I still have people saying, well, you know, if I was here or, you know, things like that. The other day, somebody, I read in the paper that so-and-so was better than Wayne Gretzky because, you know, he had the experience. And you know, I kind of thought, well, if he's got so much experience, how come he hasn't got the 152-point record? The following season, any remaining critics were silenced. In the history of the NHL, no one had ever scored 50 goals in fewer than 50 games. Gretzky did it in 39. He has broken the record! Gretzky has done the unbelievable! Patrick gave it away. Here's Gretzky. The next to fall was Phil Esposito's mark of 76 goals in a season. There's the record. Gretzky scored 92. At times, it seemed Wayne was more popular than the game itself. He signed lucrative endorsement deals, lending his name to everything from breakfast cereal to soda pop. Tastes great, Mom! This is my good pal, Joey Moss. Every day, Joey works hard in the oil. Wayne continued to work with charities, and when he admitted to a love of soap operas, they made him a guest star. Call me Wayne. Everybody does. Wayne was recognized by fans at every turn, but to his mother, Phyllis, he was just another one of the boys. Do you ever do dishes, make beds, clean basements? Wayne? Yeah. <laughs> you kidding? <laughs> Somebody had to skate. <laughs> shovel walks. Are you kidding? Hold on. Listen, the only shovel. thing he shoveled was the ice in the back here. <laughs> and his three brothers are the same way. That's all they do, too. <laughs> the backyard rink in Brantford was now a place of legend. And Keith, Glenn, and Brent fell under the glow of the Gretzky spotlight. While members of the media all looked for the next one, Walter was reluctant to make comparisons. Well, each one is different. You know, like, we hate to compare one against the other. Uh, every boy is different. They have their own identities. Although Keith and Brent were selected in the NHL draft, they would share little of their older brother's success. On the backyard rink, Walter Gretzky had taught his son that hockey was a thinking game. Go to where the puck is going, not where it's been, was his constant refrain. And even as he faced the greatest players in the game, it often seemed that the puck belonged to Wayne alone. Soon the records he was breaking were his own. The doubters were gone. Wayne Gretzky had earned his nickname, the Great One. Wayne has never been clocked as a, the fastest skater in the world, but try to stay with him. He moves across that ice very, very quickly. Great playmaking, great vision. Um, he was also um, very keen at finding open ice, and his whole team seemed to look for him in the open ice. And boom, away he'd go. I wanted to hit him so badly sometimes, but I just really couldn't get a piece of him. He was like a master chess player. He knew where to go, where he wasn't going to really run into a lot of traffic and yet be most effective. Nobody saw the ice better than Wayne Gretzky. Nobody ever passed the puck better than Wayne Gretzky. And nobody ever knew what you were going to do before you even knew it than Wayne Gretzky. He was always one step ahead of everybody uh, before he got the puck. He knew what he was going to do. He knew what the other players uh, were going to do against him. And for that reason, he was probably the best uh, that ever played. And if Wayne wasn't displaying his usual greatness on the ice, Oilers coach Glenn Sather knew exactly what to do. Walter was such a big influence on Wayne's career that um, if Wayne would be struggling or if there was a big game or really needed a win, uh, they would always fly Walter in. Remember Mr. Sather phoning me? He said, uh, Walter, you got any time coming to you? Because he knew I would save my days at Bell Canada. And I said, yeah, why? He said, listen, we have to win the next game. Wayne well, always plays better when you're here. I'll send you a ticket. you got to come to the next game. 
When we saw Walter there, it was uh, it was exciting for just as exciting for us after a while as it was for Wayne, and uh, or maybe even more so. Between 1984 and 88, Wayne Gretzky led the Oilers to four Stanley Cup victories. Edmonton was home to a hockey dynasty. We were we were good. You know, now that it's over, you can look back and say we were good because we really were a great team. But at the time, we didn't realize that. We were just enjoying it. We just went out and did what we did best, and that was just to play hockey. At the 1988 Stanley Cup parade, Edmonton fans showed their love for Gretzky. That summer, the great one showed that he loved more than hockey. It was dubbed Canada's royal wedding. Wayne Gretzky, the king of hockey, was about to marry Janet Jones, an American actress. The invitation list was 650 long, but thousands arrived. The dress was rumored to have cost $40,000. The entire spectacle, more than a million. It should have been a summer of celebration for Gretzky. But the next time Edmonton fans got to see their hero, they heard a shocking announcement from team owner Peter Pocklington. The Edmonton Oilers have agreed to trade Wayne Gretzky to Los Angeles. For the benefit of Wayne Gretzky, my new wife, and our expected child in the new year, that it would be beneficial for everyone involved to let, let me play with the Los Angeles Kings. What it really transpired was that I felt, OK, if I'm going to be moved, I'm going to guide where I'm going to be moved to. Because basically, Peter needed my backing to be able to have any chance of moving me. But um, as I said, there comes a time when, when uh... the trade was seen as a betrayal. Fans blamed Pocklington. The tabloids blamed Janet. But one fact remained: Wayne was gone. Do I regret it? No. Do I look back and say, could we have won two or three more championships? Yes. But that was the decision that I made, and you have to live with that. In 1988, Wayne Gretzky made the move from Edmonton to Los Angeles, from hockey's heartland to Hollywood, from the best team in the game to an 18th place franchise. Los Angeles was a new beginning for Gretzky. You know, the big thing is the fact that you become just an everyday person and, and able to do things and, and, and go places and realize and know that people aren't staring at you. And from that point of it, it's been, my lifestyle has changed and it's been great. In 1988, Janet and Wayne welcomed their first daughter, Paulina. Two years later, a son, Ty, and in 1992, a second son, Trevor. Another generation of the Gretzky family has taken to the ice. In the land of the stars, Gretzky Sean. Kings games were selling out for the first time in the team's history. It began a boom time for the NHL, and the league would soon expand across the southern U.S. In October of 1989, Wayne Gretzky became the NHL's all-time points leader. Wayne Gretzky has had it and broken Gordie Howe's record. That was probably one of the moments I'll never forget in my career because it just happened bang bang and it was in Edmonton where it deserved to be and where it belonged. Gordy was there and he came on the ice and my dad came out and my wife and it was a real special time. As Wayne rose to the top of the game, Walter Gretzky became Canada's most famous hockey dad. In 1991, Walter suffered a near fatal brain aneurysm. Suddenly, Wayne was without his mentor. You know, for me, my dad was kind of my right arm. And all of a sudden, that's cut off. And um, it was a real tough situation. You know, not just for me, it was devastating for my whole family, and especially my mother. The man who had chronicled every step of his son's career lost all memory of Wayne's accomplishments. Time for me, from the early 70s, most of the time to the end of the 90s, doesn't exist. I didn't even know who my children were for a while. They put pictures on the wall uh, at the hospital of all the kids. I didn't know who they were. 
Walter's years of difficult rehabilitation weighed heavily on Wayne's mind. When the Kings lost to Montreal in the Stanley Cup Finals, Gretzky hinted at retirement. Janet convinced him that his father would want him to carry on. Janet was really a huge influence in that sense that, you know, stepping forward to saying, you know, he would want you to play and he would really uh, be disappointed if you weren't playing. Gretzky took to the ice with renewed passion. Goal number 802 erased another Gordie Howe milestone. But Wayne was already planning for life after hockey. He had opened his own restaurant in Toronto, inspired by Sunday dinners at Grandma Gretzky's farm. Wayne was a lot more involved in the development of the concept than a lot of people believe. From the moment I started talking to the Gretzky family about the restaurant, they always talked about how great his grandma's pierogies were. And so we, we had to have the pierogies on the menu. The meatloaf was another one. There were a few things that he thought should be on the menu to reflect him and his family. Wayne still wanted another shot at the Stanley Cup. But at age 35, time was running out. As the Kings struggled in the standings, the usually diplomatic Gretzky spoke out. I'd like to win, and I really needed to know if that's what everybody in this organization's feelings were. Are we gonna, if we're going to wait three years to try to win a championship, that, that really doesn't do Wayne Gretzky any good. Although Wayne remained one of the top players in the game, the Los Angeles Kings embarked on a youth movement, trading the veteran Gretzky to the St. Louis Blues. The following year, he signed as a free agent with the New York Rangers. Walks down the slot. Peter Gretzky scores! He scores! He looks, now he shoots. Score! It's a hat trick for Wayne Gretzky! In April of 1999, Wayne Gretzky announced the end of his 21-year professional career. When he left the ice for the final time, he owned 61 National Hockey League records and more honors and awards than any other player. And as always, Walter was at his side. I never would have dreamed. He started when he was six years old, and uh, he retired when he was 38. That's 32 years later. As I was skiing around, I just felt more joy than anything. Every game I played, I played my hardest. Uh, I felt proud of my career, and I felt honored that they were cheering for me, but I also knew it was the right thing to do. Please welcome Wayne Gretzky, inducted to the Hockey Hall of Fame in the player category. When Wayne retired, the three-year waiting period was waived, and he was immediately inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame. Thank you very much. The Hall of Fame was only the beginning of the honors for Gretzky. His number 99 jersey was retired throughout the league. And although his career took him to several NHL cities, to many he will always be an oiler. And the people of Edmonton paid tribute to their favorite son. As Wayne prepares to officially dedicate Wayne Gretzky Drive. To people that weren't even born during the glory days of the Oilers, Gretzky was still a hero. If you couldn't play any professional sport, what would you do as a job? <laughs> Uh, what would I do as a job? Well, right now I could probably clean my highway. Uh, <laughs> Wayne did get a new job. In February 2001, he returned to the NHL as part owner of the Phoenix Coyotes. Janet was very supportive of it. She wanted him to have a new challenge in his life and, you know, overseeing... The hockey organization uh, at the NHL level in a coat and tie was something that she herself felt would be very, very timely for Wayne. New uniforms and a new building have changed the look of the Phoenix Coyotes. But even for the great one, running an NHL franchise is anything but easy. The first thing you learn on the other side, it's a lot more difficult than people think. Uh, just from the people point of view, you know, you're not dealing now with yourself or just the locker room. You're dealing with you know, your farm system, your farm team players, uh, your trainers, uh, your office staff, your scouts. Um, and believe me, everybody's got either a problem, a complaint, or something they want to ask. And that's what you deal with, and that's part of building an organization. In an area known more for golf courses than ice rinks, Gretzky faced a tough challenge. Soon he would be the center of attention in the birthplace of the game. 
As a player, Wayne Gretzky represented his country on eight occasions. When asked to lead Team Canada into the 2002 Olympics in Salt Lake City, Gretzky was ready. When you do something like this, there can't be hesitation. It's such a tough job. It's a, such a um, pressure position. And if you have hesitation, you're the wrong person to do this. And when Bob called me, I, I was absolutely um, thrilled about it, excited about it. There was no ifs, ands, or buts. When I went down to L.A., I was so impressed with uh, how excited he was but more importantly, how prepared he was. Uh, he had the list of all the players uh, that he thought could play. Uh, he wanted to talk about the style of play. But I can tell you from the first phone call to the first visit, I was convinced he was the right person. Those two are cohesive, so those are the four main guys that we... Gretzky's version of Team Canada was built on his own style of play, skill, creativity, and above all, teamwork. He had some kind of feel about how these guys could come together because that's another big part of, uh, of a team building uh, situation. And somehow, when the selection process was finished, uh, we've had uh, the types of players that were more interested in the team than themselves. And it's the same way Wayne's always been. The team was always more important than anything uh, about himself. You know, my biggest thing of all is when you get in the locker room, we want you to have a lot of pride. That's what makes you great. We want you to have dedication. That's what makes you great. But we also know that everyone has egos. And what we try to do is every person check his ego at the door when they enter. And I, I know I'm looked at, so I know if I'm doing that and, and Pat Quinn's doing it and Mario Lemieux's doing it, it just kind of spreads all the way through each and every guy. Canada was heavily favored as the tournament began. But when they fell 5-2 to Sweden in the opening game, all eyes were on Wayne. I know how important this gold medal is to our players, and I know how important it is to our country and our fans. And I remember saying, we made some bad decisions here. Are we, you know, are we this bad? The Americans were trying to pull a little head game with it, you know, and just saying we can't play, we, we have to play it. Uh, this kind of game and that kind of game. Well, it was all baloney, and, and Wayne went right through it and then stepped right up with the media. Uh, some of the things that are being said is that there's a little bit of unhappiness from some of the veteran players on the Canadian team. But do you feel that these are things being spread by other people, such Absolutely. as other coaches? American propaganda. <laughs> They're trying to state that there was issues between the players and the coaching staff, that the Canadian hockey style wasn't the right style to win an Olympic game. So he felt our country uh, and more importantly our game was under attack. And here's a break from Ariel. Facing the Czech Republic, Canada got off to a strong start. But late in the game, with a score tied at three, a vicious cross check on Canada's Theron Fleury ignited Gretzky's anger. People talk about, oh, I love the hockey at the Olympics, but quite honestly, it's dirtier hockey than the NHL hockey is. And then Fleury's knocked down in front of the net. He's hurt, though. He's still down. It struck a chord in me because <clears throat> even as a child growing up, all we ever read was the Canadian players are hooligans and the Canadian players should be thrown in jail. And that's kind of how my, my adrenaline just started flowing over those first 10 or 11 minutes of the press conference. Um, am I hot? Yeah, I'm hot because I'm tired, tired of people taking shots at Canadian hockey. If we would have did what they did tonight, it would be a big story. I think the guy should be suspended for the rest of the tournament. Um, you know, what really bothered me about it is nobody said a word about it after the game. There wasn't one question of, do I think that was a penalty? Do I think it was something wrong? Do I think it was something that should be looked at as a suspension? Had that been a Canadian player? It would have been like chaos. And I know the whole world wants us to lose, except for Canada and Canada fans and our players, and we'll be there. We'll be standing. I remember getting up the next morning going, oh, my goodness. I, I really I got maybe a little too much passion in that interview. But, you know, if I had to do it all over again, I would, because I was defending not only uh, our, our game in our country, but the people of our country and the system of Hockey Canada. Wayne was right. On the day of the gold medal game, Canada was standing. See, the, in these hills, there's gold in these hills. It's all Canadian gold. Gretzky was one game away from delivering on his gold medal promise. Gets the zone. Power passes in. A thrilling 5-2 victory over Team USA brought Canada its first gold medal in 50 years. I think one of the neatest uh, moments was 
when we went up by three goals against the U.S., he leaned over and he said, now we might have some fun. It was a sea of red. Canadians standing there, just standing, waving Canadian flags, just waving them. And there were adults beside us when I was when I was sitting there in the crowd. They were crying, just crying out of sheer happiness. Wayne was part of all that, all that. That's just, I can't find words to describe it. What hockey talent you're looking at here today, folks. People uh, don't maybe know this. Only the players get a gold medal. So as great as it was, I didn't get one, but that's okay. In my mind, I know I was part of a gold medal team, and that's fine by me. And tucked it off today. As Canada's gold medal team celebrated, Gretzky proved that even with the best players in the world, a little good luck charm can help. Three inches underneath the ice, the very first day for good luck for Canada to win the gold. Nobody knew it was there. Women won gold, and men won gold. Wayne returned to Edmonton for the Heritage Classic. In a celebration of the roots of the game, Commonwealth Stadium became a backyard rink beyond any child's imagination. The decision to don his old number 99 was difficult. I really don't believe in old-timers hockey. I think that people's memories of players and athletes are that of when they're successful with what they're doing. And I, I just, as a fan, I just never thought it was something that I would want to do or watch. You know, I think Kevin Lowe will be the first one to tell you that what really made the Heritage Classic be a go, the green light on, we're going to put the event together, was when Wayne said, I'll play. Although he'd said he'd never play in an old-timers game and, uh, and I would imagine unlikely ever to do it again, this wasn't about, you know, a bunch of old guys getting together. This was really about hockey. I really felt like I had a responsibility to the Oilers and the city of Edmonton. Um, and more importantly, I wanted my kids to see me play in an Oiler uniform. Hey! Hey! Jesus! Hey, how are you doing? Hey, hey! The Heritage Classic was a chance for Wayne to reconnect with old friends and enjoy the camaraderie of the locker room. The greatest hockey player who ever lived, number 99, Wayne Gretzky! The Heritage Classic, I think, for Wayne represented... You know, hockey is in its simplest, purest form. You know, him skating at his grandmother's farm and skating on the back rink of, at Walter and Phyllis's house in Brantford, and that's what it meant to him. And it meant that uh, to everyone involved. So I think it was even bigger and better than the NHL and the city of Edmonton and the Oilers expected it to be. It was really, truly something. And, you know, if, if they try to do this game again, and I'm sure somebody's going to try to do it somewhere, it's just not going to be the same. It might be good, but it's never going to be like that game in November in Edmonton. Later that day, Janet and Wayne Gretzky watched as 14-year-old Paulina, the oldest of their five children, stepped into the spotlight for the first time. Nobody, absolutely no one, told us Paulina was going to sing. We had no idea. When she walked out on that stage, I could already catch my breath. I couldn't believe it. I was, and the way she walked around there, so full of confidence. Well, I think what she did was harder to do than what we did. To see her get up there and not only do it, but do a great job and, and be very calm and relaxed about it. It was one of the most proudest days of my life. In October of 2002, Wayne Gretzky's role as hockey ambassador was raised to another level as the king of hockey met the queen of England. The people I've met is because of the NHL and the game of hockey. I mean, you meet the Queen of England, and I used to be in Greenbrier Public School and sing God Save the Queen every morning like every other person in grade five and grade six. She said that she actually enjoyed hockey. She said she'd been to one other game in, uh, I believe, in 1950 in Maple Leaf Gardens. 
she was very pleasant, and uh, it, was a, it was one of the experiences of a lifetime. Gretzky has continued both his high-profile endorsement deals and his work on behalf of charities. In 2002, he formed the Gretzky Foundation to help provide hockey equipment to young people in need. One of the, the things about being a celebrity is that you can't help people who are less fortunate. That part of being Wayne Gretzky is the most rewarding as far as I'm concerned of helping people that just maybe never get an opportunity uh, because they can't afford it. And those with 9,999 US dollars can help the Gretzky Foundation and spend a week on the ice with number 99. I actually play once a year and that's my fantasy cap. I get on for four or five days. I participate on each team uh, at least once, so I play in every game. We're fortunate enough to help raise some money for my foundation, and it just turns out to be a great five days. Hockey Canada turned to Gretzky again in the summer of 2004. After the experience of the Salt Lake City Olympics, Wayne was looking forward to the chance for a repeat performance. When Bob asked me again to be part of this, I just thought, you know, I'm going to be sitting at home in August and, and I'm going to be saying, why am I not doing this and why wasn't I part of it and why didn't I do it? And I just, I've never turned, really turned down Team Canada. This goal, shot! Canada moving in. It'll be played in front of the next goal! Oh, baby! Three, three, move along. No chance, goal! The World Cup of Hockey. Another victory for the great one. We always like to think, well, we invented the game and it's our game and that sort of thing. Well, it wasn't there for a while. And, and, and uh, Gretzky uh, led the way. When he was a player, he made the guys around him better. Now, with the Canadian teams, um, he does the same thing. He makes people better. I think the greatest attribute of Wayne Gretzky, the thing that's going to set him apart forever, is that from the time he was 10 years old, he has always understood the responsibilities that go with being Wayne Gretzky. His career seemed to be destined for greatness, so if you're at all, at all involved with Wayne and you're able to hold up your end of the bargain, whichever end that was or how big or how small it was, then you were going to get towed along into something special. I can't imagine anyone in our lifetime that has been more symbolic of our country. We're fortunate to have him. I'm Canadian, I'm proud to be a Canadian. I mean, everything I have in my life is because of minor hockey in Canada and the National Hockey League. I've got to, to go a lot of places, I got to be part of a lot of great teams. Everything to do with the game is wonderful in my mind. When he started out, he was just another boy, like any other Canadian boy, wanting to skate and wanting to play hockey. And it, it just grew and grew. Even I can say, wow. And I'm his dad. For all his scoring records, Wayne Gretzky turned out to be, above all, a playmaker. When he retired, he'd assisted on more goals than any other player. Thanks for watching our show. For Life and Times, I'm Anne Marie McDonald. See you next time.